Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, I'm excited to have Asheville School's head coach, Nick Whitmore, join us. Now, Nick's a unique character. Uh, He grew up in New Hampshire. His father's a head D1 basketball coach. And then for college, instead of playing, he actually went to Rhode Island to coach for a couple years and then transferred out, also as a coach, to Boise State. So he's got D1 experience in those two schools. He also coached at the University of San Francisco for Rex Walters. And then he was assistant coach at NEPSEC AAA School, New Hampton, under Pete Hutchins, and then took over the reins there when Pete left to go to Dartmouth. And Nick has been at the Asheville School. He is now starting his fourth year there. Uh, We have a great conversation. Uh, We talk about a lot of things such as, you know, a New England prep school being in Western North Carolina mountains and the benefits and challenges of that. We talk about how he determines playing time and the data system that he's incorporated into his uh, every part of his basketball team's um, court time. So if you want playing time, if you work on these uh, areas of the game, you will get playing time, which is a unique uh, system I've not heard of at the high school and prep school level yet. He talks about AAA, AA, single A, um, what college coaches are looking for, and much, much more. So really enjoyed this conversation with Coach Nick Whitmore at the Asheville School. I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Corey. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. And one of the reasons I want to uh, pick your brain on a little bit is about you coaching at three different D1 programs, Rhode Island, Boise State, University of San Francisco. Can you kind of walk me through each place and kind of what you took away from there that you use now as a prep school coach? Yeah, sure. So my... My journey to become a head basketball coach and assistant head of school for enrollment management at Asheville School has been a little atypical, I guess. So I grew up around basketball. My dad was the head coach at the University of Vermont. He then left to go to St. Bonaventure. So, you know, I kind of grew up always knowing that I wanted to coach. And so when I graduated from high school, I had the opportunity to work as a student assistant at Rhode Island um, eventually transferred to Boise State to have the opportunity to try something new and be in a different part of the country. Um, and I was really fortunate uh, to be able to work for two great coaches there. So Jim Barron at the University of Rhode Island uh, and then Greg Graham at Boise State University. So this was the WAC too. So we would go all the way from Hawaii to Louisiana Tech. So it's a different kind of conference, but it was great for me. You know, I was 18 years old, getting to learn the behind the scenes working of Division One basketball, around really good players be able to get in the gym Um, at Boise State we didn't have a director of operations so that allowed me the opportunity to do video to help with travel Um, and this was old VHS days when you were manually popping tapes in and out and you know it's it's a lot more work but uh, but it was great for me you know very different systems the Atlantic 10 at that point was a really physical kind of grind league where the WAC and particularly us at Boise State were trying to get to 100 points and we shot a lot of threes and early offense so so that was really neat for me and, and just being young and in a lot of ways insecure in who I was as a coach trying to manage that, that world and, and learn from some really great coaches was was really instrumental in me becoming who I am today as a coach, I think so. Um, but that was great. I'm really fortunate to have had the opportunity. Uh, and then down the road to work at USF with Rex Walters, who in my opinion is, is one of the best coaches in the nation. Uh, he's at the Charlotte Hornets right now as an assistant coach, but, but that was awesome. You know, high level, how to compete, how to organize and oversee a program. Um, really proud of what we did there. We finished second in the WCC. Rex was the coach of the year. We did some really neat things and, that led me to, to get back to New England ultimately. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun coaching at those three places and learned a ton from three really good coaches. But I want to thank you, you being a, a, tra- a coaching transfer as a, as a college assistant coach, like that's something I've never heard of before. Like what kind of sparked that in your brain? And then of all the colleges out there, why Boise State? Yeah, don't give me too much credit. I was not recruited <laughs> to transfer. <laughs> uh, so I did two years at URI and was in New England. I grew up in New Hampshire. So, you know, it kind of made sense. And after two years there, 
um, really kind of got the itch to explore something new with my college experience. And I thought about transferring, but I, I knew coaching wanted to be, uh, or was, excuse me, at the center of what I wanted to do. So um, it was late in the process. And I started to look at schools that had strong English programs, which was my major, uh, and kind of happened upon Boise State. And it's kind of random, but, you know, it seemed at the time like something that would be fun and different and outside of the norm of what I had experienced. And so I reached out to Coach Graham and applied and got in and, and that was kind of it. So this was late. It was May. Uh, so I just finished URI and decided to, to transfer out there. And the coaches at URI were great. They helped me, you know, with recommendations and get in touch with that staff. So uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was atypical and, and it was not like uh, I was being highly sought after for my managerial skills. It was really, I wanted to try something new and be in a different part of the country. And I had a blast, you know, Boise State was, was really instrumental in me becoming who I am as a person and um, great coaches and great people. And we were there with Kobe Carl, who's now coaching and a lot of really established basketball people that have gone on to, to coach in a variety of different levels. Was the football team rocking when you were there? Yeah, so I was in the dorm with, um, drawing a blank on his name, but the player that proposed to his girlfriend right after the bowl game. So that was my second year at Boise. So that sort of took it to a whole nother level. But, um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it became essentially Duke basketball, with people camping out for tickets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, a, it's a really neat city, you know, and it's boomed now. But uh, the opportunity to be around high-level athletics and be in the mountains and have all the natural beauty at your fingertips is pretty unique. And then explain to those that might not know what a director of basketball operations is and, and all the roles that come with it. Sure. So uh, my, my quick elevator pitch is if you can be a director of operations at the division one level, you can probably do any job at a really high level. So uh, you are essentially in charge of managing the day-to-day -day operations of that program. So all of the grunt work, you know, the travel, the meals, the academics, making sure the GAs are, are doing what they need to be doing, making sure the head coach knows his travel and, you know, the bus is on time and we know exactly how far it is to get meals and make sure they're on time. So all those kind of things, doing shoot around, um, getting to know the players, supporting them and then supporting the assistant coaches as well. So it's really an all encompassing job. Uh, it's changed since I was doing it. Um, when I was there, it was pretty strict. You couldn't be on the court. So during practice, we were on the sidelines. Um, I was fortunate with Coach Walter. She gave me a great opportunity to get on the road as we transition coaches. So I, I got to recruit a little bit in between um, some changes that we had on staff. But but yeah, it's a, you know it's, it's one of those jobs that I think if, if you can do it well in a high pressure situation like that, you can go into any setting in the world and be successful. Yeah, I've always thought being an assistant coach would be easier than the dobo, and the dobo is usually the first job you kind of get. You do video coordinator sometimes, and then bump up to dobo, then assistant coach, but. To me, looking in from the outside, it, it just seems like it would be an 18 hour a day job. It is, yeah. <laughs> so okay. uh, I think my first year at San Francisco, I went from our first practice, which was I think October 15th at that point through the end of our season uh, in the office every day. So, or, you know, playing. So we were in the Diamond Head Classic, we played on Christmas morning. So, we, you know, we didn't have breaks. And I think that work ethic is it's really translatable to prep school and boarding school life where you're going all the time and you're kind of all in. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, let's talk about your current job. You've been at Asheville school now for three years and you're coming there uh, from new England. How does a school like Asheville school kind of compare and contrast to a new England prep school? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, very similarly, um, you know, we are 300 kids, we're an independent boarding school, 300 acre campus, um, high level academics, great facilities, beautiful campus. The perk, I think, for us and, and where we're a little different from some other schools is we have access to Asheville. So, um, you know, you, 15 minutes, you can be in downtown Asheville, 10 minutes, you're in West Asheville, where there's a lot of coffee shops and restaurants and um, you can cross the street and there's restaurants and a grocery store. And so we have access to all those amenities that I think um, are really a benefit of living in a place like Asheville. Um, so our students can enjoy that and get out into the community and, and see the city and get to the Blue Ridge Mountains. And we certainly embrace a lot of those types of opportunities on the weekend. But yeah, it's been great in a lot of ways. You know, I think if you were to, to drop our school in Massachusetts or Connecticut, it would feel pretty normal. Uh, and then 
On the flip side, if you visit from New Hampshire or Vermont and you walk onto our campus, it, it feels like you're in New England in a lot of ways. Uh, we just don't have quite as much snow. So, yeah. uh, so you know, we get maybe six days instead of six months. Yeah. And just to concur, when I came down to visit you a few months ago, it, it was beautiful with the trees, the mountains. Um, it, is, it is an old school prep school in the, in the best sense. And um, yeah, you're right across the street from all the, the restaurants right near an interstate. So it's, it's a great location. But let me challenge you on this. One of the things New England prep school coaches always say is, hey, we've got hundreds of colleges within a couple hour drive to us. So you will be seen. Coaches have an opportunity to take a few hours uh, to drive to see you during an open gym and be back at their school. Yeah. You guys are a little bit more remote in the South. So how do you, what's your answer to that when families might be looking at you and a New England prep school? Yeah, you know, I think they're all great at the end of the day. You know, if I'm looking at any schools that are a peer school, to us, I think there's benefits. And I think really it's about fit in what you're looking for. Um, I have been really surprised by how important basketball is in North Carolina. And it may be, you know, it's kind of like a, an obvious assumption with Duke and North Carolina and how many schools there are here. Um, but they call it the hoop state for a reason. And it's a big deal in terms of media support, um, you know, those that get out and, and are able to document kids and, you know, Phenom Hoop Report guys do a great job. Justin Byerly does a great job. Trent Marquette. So there's tons of access to scouts that can help in this process. Um, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, it's pretty similar. We're an hour and 40 minutes from Charlotte. We're an hour and 15 from Knoxville. UNC Asheville is here. We host the SOCON tournament uh, here in Asheville. And a lot of those schools will use our gym as a practice site. So um, in that sense, you know, I think it's, it's a regional group of schools that are perhaps different, but uh, I'm, I've always been a believer that if you're good enough, people are going to come and find you. And uh, We have kids that are being recruited by schools in California and schools in New England and all over the place. So uh, I think a lot of what we can do is, is the same. It's just, you know, you might be to SoCon and Davidson and some of those schools compared to, you know, the Mac or the A-10 or whatever. Uh, and we have Davidson here, obviously, in a lot of those schools. So um, they're all great. I, I think it's really just a matter of fit. And the one thing that I, I really like is, we don't offer a postgrad year, but we do allow athletes to reclassify when they enter. So we're really able to develop kids that, you know, want to come as freshmen, sophomores, repeat juniors, and, and have them for a few years and, and kind of have a solid base of what we're going to be moving forward. Well, let me ask you about that, because at New Hampton, when you were there, you had postgrads. So yes. what are the pros and cons of having a postgrad versus not in your program? Sure. I think they're, they're both great. It, again, really is a personal preference and what you're looking for. Um, I think a lot of times in New Hampton, we had kids that played out their senior year, loved their high school experience and wanted to look to see if they could bolster their recruitment or, you know, maybe they needed a little extra work academically. So that timeline might just be a little bit later where they're looking in, you know, February, March, April, as things start to materialize or they play out April and then say, Hey, I want, I want to do one more year to see what I can get. So our kids, a lot of times without, the postgrad offering are, are kids that are looking at a school like us early on, perhaps. Uh, so they know as a sophomore, I really want to challenge myself academically, socially. I want to be on a boarding school campus. And so they're just going through the process potentially as a sophomore, junior. And maybe they know at that point, hey, I want to give myself one extra year um, to recover from injury or with COVID and this strange transfer portal that we're existing in right now, you know, to just have one extra year to develop as a player or student or person. So um, I really just think it's, it's timeline more so than anything, but uh, they're both great. And I think it's really a personal decision and what that student and that family is looking for. But have you noticed anything like back in your old days, a kid that comes in for nine months as a postgrad versus a kid that's in a school, whether it's Asheville or New Hampton for multiple years, I've always heard the old term that it takes two, one year to get used to prep school ball. And the second year you got to kind of find your stride and it's a lot more comfortable. Do you, have you experienced that as a coach? And is that something I, you think is true or? Yeah. You know, I think there's, there's benefits to both. And we had great postgrads in New Hampton. I mean, you know, Tyson Walker, who's now the starting point guard at Michigan state was a one year postgrad with us and uh, came from a day school in New York and he was awesome and hit the ground running and, you know, I would have loved to have him for one more year if he wanted to do another. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it really just depends on, on the kid. And, you know, we attract a lot of international students and I think it's great for them to have a year to come and get settled to American basketball and the American school system and what it's like to be away from home. And then I think that second year is, you know, certainly if you're at a place for, 
for more than nine months, you have a better understanding of people and the culture and the basketball system. And, and I've really enjoyed that this year four for me. And we've got a core group of kids that have been in our program since they came as sophomores. And um, I'm able to coach them in a much different manner than had, you know, we had an influx of seven kids coming in or something like that. So these guys know our offensive system and it really does become, you know, a, a culture that year to year they're establishing and maintaining. So we've got new kids coming in now and, and our returners are able to say, Hey, this is how we do things here. This is our system. This is how we play. Um, so it just helps those guys get acclimated. And, and I really like that. So it's been fun for me to, to be able to see both sides of it and both are great and they both have challenges, but uh, that's been fun for me down here. Oh, great. Now you work in the admission department at the Asheville school. For those that don't know, can you tell people what an admission department at a prep school does? Sure. So our job is to uh, meet interested families, talk about our school, be kind of the, the people on the ground and the first point of contact for them as they go through this process and then help them through applying to Asheville School and then the follow up steps and helping them through financial aid. Uh, if they come to campus, we're arranging their tour, we're arranging students to to be part of their visit and to make sure that they understand our school and our culture. Um, and then ultimately at the end, our job is to sift through these great candidates we have and, and build our school from there and, and figure out who, you know, is joining us and who's a great mission appropriate student. What's the best part about working in admissions? I like meeting kids. So for me, that's, that's the most fun part of the job. Uh, when we go out and we travel and we go to fairs, the opportunity to talk about a place that I, I feel is really awesome. And then to be able to share that experience with students that are, are interested in what we can offer and are a great fit. But for me, that's, that's always the most fun. I, I like interacting with kids and I like meeting families and uh, you know, we've got kids from 25 different countries. And so it's great to have a team with kids from Turkey and you know, we're in the dorm with students from you know, Sweden and Germany and England and you know, Thailand and everywhere around the globe. So I think that's really cool for me as a, as a selfishly, as a person, as an educator, I like to, to meet people from all over. Absolutely. And what about what's the biggest challenge of working in an admission department? Yeah, I think that's uh, the unfortunate moment where you have a kid who's really great and we just don't have space for them, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's the hardest part is, you know, we wish we were able to accept all the great candidates that we have, but ultimately we're, we're finite in our size. So I, I think that's definitely the hardest part. Yeah. Now you do a, a, interviews with kids and it, does, does Asheville school offer merit? Yes. So we are a need-based financial aid school. And then we also do have a, a pool of merit-based aid. Okay. Now I've heard this rumor and you tell me if it's true or not, but if a kid has an interview with someone like yourself in an admission department and just kicks butt, uh, really impresses you guys, shows a lot of personality, asks great questions, more merit aid has been given to kids like that. Have you seen that happen before? I think at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a cumulative image of the student. So if there's somebody that we really want and they uh, are qualified for financial aid, we do have specific merit scholarships where we're trying to attract a certain type of kid or from a certain uh, geographical location. Uh, we might have an endowed fund for something along those lines. But certainly, yeah, you know, I think we want we want the best kids on campus and uh, kids that are a great fit for us. And the interview is an important piece of that to present who you are and give us a sense of, of them as a student and them as a person. Yeah, but my, I might ask that wrong. But yeah. like the interview process is very important. So you can either really help your cause or hurt your cause, correct? Sure. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Gotcha, okay. And well, obviously for we understand, you know, kids, if I was a 16 year old having to jump on a Zoom with you know, me as an adult, I would be nervous too. So obviously oh. we understand that you know, we're, we're trying our best to make sure they can put their best foot forward too, but it's a hard and awkward situation at times. Uh, so we get that too. You know, it's not like this is make or break for a student. It's, a, it's the whole picture. So your letters of recommendation, your parent essay, your essay, what your coaches say about you if you're an athlete or, you know, your director if you're into theatrical productions. So yeah, it's, it's a whole picture, but certainly I think the, the interview is a way to really present yourself. Yeah. One time I interviewed a kid just, just to come on the prep athletics family and he, he could see the TV screen kind of flashing in the background. He was kind of barely paying attention to me. And I just ended the call. I was like, you know what? I don't just don't think it's a good fit. You know, I, I wish you the best of luck. So like 
interviews are, are key, I think. And you can really screw them up if you don't do them right too as a kid. But yeah, you're right. A lot of pressure. It's tough for a kid. Probably their first interview for most of them. So yeah. <laughs> I get that. Um, before you were at Asheville School, you were yeah. at uh, NEPSAC AAA School, New Hampton, right? Sure. It's got a storied history. What made New Hampton so special? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, you know, I think it's a number of factors. So when I left San Francisco, Pete Hutchins was there and we spoke and uh, we had a great conversation about New Hampton as a school and it's close to where I grew up. So it's about 30 minutes from there. And I actually remember going to watch Rashad McCants um, and Jason's teams at Brewster for the New Hampton Invitational during the winter. And um, so I had familiarity with it. And I just think the culture of New Hampton is, is really unique and the importance placed on athletics and the whole person. Uh, and so for me, it was, you know, it was a really great experience to go and learn from Pete. And I'm hugely thankful that I was able to do it as an assistant before taking over, because I think there is uh, particularly for college coaches, there's an idea that you go into one of these schools and um, it's like college. And in a lot of ways, it's not. Uh, and so for me, learning from Pete was great. And then in two years, when he went to Dartmouth, I was really fortunate to be offered the job by Jamie Arsenault, who was the previous coach there. And um, there's just a long culture and history of great coaches from, you know, Coach Tilton and Coach LaShore Coach that was there and Coach Arsenal and Coach Hutchins and, you know, just the story of history of basketball and, and the relationships that I was able to build have been great. And Andrew, who's now the head coach, has done an awesome job there. He was my assistant and I've hired uh, as my assistant coach, who's the director of community belonging, diversity and equity here on campus, was our B team coach and played mm -hmm. at New England. So um, and he's down here with me at Asheville, which has been great. So it's just a really, it's a unique place to live and the community there is, is really strong and they support basketball. And yeah, it was fun to, it was fun to be there for five years. I had my son there and my wife coached field hockey there. So it was a great community. Oh, that's great. And then you guys are AAA yes. and, you know, AAA, why don't you explain AAA, AA, single A, the differences? Because I get asked that question a lot. I want to hear how you explain it and then I have a follow up on that. Sure. Uh, so I think AAA is, in a lot of ways, I think it's become schools that self select into that league that really value um, basketball as a program at their school. So it might be, hey, we want to we wanna invest and be able to compete at the highest possible level. Uh, and every school is different in what they can do and, and what their end goal is. Uh, so I think, yeah, you know, in, in my mind, it was the AAA is, is you know, a self-selected group that want to compete with the best in New England. Um, and then, you know, breaking down from there, it's, it's a variety of schools and, and where they feel the best level of competition for their school and where their program is at. Uh, lies. Uh, so I think it's really, you know, it's a, it's a school to school decision um, based on how strong your team is and where the best level of competition for you is at that time. And I think at New Hampton, we were really fortunate. We were able to build some really strong teams. Um, and a lot of that was work that was there before I got there. Um, and so I, I think that culture existed to be able to attract top tier athletes. Um, and so every school is a little bit different, you know, and, and there's variance year to year on how strong the team is. And and those kind of things. But I think it's, yeah, where your footprint is and then where you feel most comfortable competing as a school and what's best for the institution. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this one too, because parents are always like, I don't want to play single A, I want to play triple A. But you being a former D1 assistant, let me ask you this. If I've got the same player and he's at a middle tier single A school or a middle tier double A or a middle tier triple A, he's the same player. We're talking clones here. Will a college coach look at him differently based on what class he's in or what team he's on? I, you know, I don't think so. Um, my experience has been, um, you know, I think if you're good enough, they're going to find you as long as you're putting yourself in a position where you have people that are advocating for you and, and working for you. Um, but I, I've always been a believer that you need to be on the court. And so here at Asheville, we try to play 10 guys as much as we possibly can because, our goal is to put them in a position that when they graduate, you know, they're able to go into college and, and play and understand how to read a scouting report and understand how to play a high level offense. And so for me, it's always been, you know, if you're coming here, we want to try to put you in those positions. And obviously you earn that it's a meritocracy, not a democracy, obviously. But uh, I think for me, that's important. And, you know, there's different, there's different scales to this. We had a player at New Hampton, which I think was the exception, but he tore his ACL in a layup line and pickup and then ended up 
enrolled and you know earned a scholarship spot at Quinnipiac in the spring um, based on access to some coaches and things like that. So I, I really think, again, it's a, it's a player by player decision. I'm always a big believer in where you can play and a coach able to see what you can do on the court. And, um, and I think, you know, a, a good coaches are able to evaluate and, and figure out what they need and who the player is uh, pretty quickly in a lot of instances. Yeah. And that's one thing. So when I have that discussion with clients, Nick, it's like, look, you can go to a team with 10 D one players, right. And you can be the 12th guy on the bench yep. or you can go to a place and be the man where there's a blend in between. Right. Yep. And I always say like, there's benefits to all three. Like if you're on the court getting minutes, that's great, but you might not be in pushing the in pushed in practice as much to whereas if you're on a team with 10 D one guys, like a Hargrave or a Brewster, Yep. Every day in practice where the development actually happens, you're going up against a high major, you know, player and you have to earn your playing time. So it's the old, it's an old debate, you know, do you go to a place where, you know, you're getting better in practice every day where you're not maybe not getting the minutes or do you go to a place where you're getting more game time? Every coach I ask at the college level has different, different theories. And, you know, when I played in high school, we were the number one team in the state of Kentucky, and I had to guard a top 50 player for my sure. three high school years and try to score against them. So my numbers were terrible. I didn't play as much in the games, but we had eight D1 guys. And when I got to college, I was way more prepared for that than my teammate who was first team all state in Idaho, who just never got challenged in practice daily and who didn't get challenged in games. And so I see both sides of it. But um, and there's no right answer. I think it comes down to what a kid wants for their experience, right? Yeah, and I would agree. And I think uh, at New Hampton, we certainly had, you know, hyper-competitive practices. And I think we've been able to do it here at Asheville. Um, it's just, a, you know, it's a different thing. And I think as a kid goes to visit, you know, different schools are going to get a sense of, okay, who's on the roster, who's the coach, and then how do I fit there? And I think it's the same advice when you're thinking about college recruitment for a lot of these players. And I think the world in some ways is very similar now with the transfer portal and yeah. the way the top tier schools are recruiting. Uh, it's had a trickle down effect where, you know, in my opinion, kids are, are a little bit undervalued coming out of high school. So, you know, a kid that might have been here, sorry, I'm off the screen here, <laughs> you know, it might be down a tier in terms of the recruitment. And I think that factors into it is, you know, do I want to go someplace where, I've got a chance to compete right away, or, you know, do I want to shoot really high? And if you look at the numbers, I, I think that's just a kid to kid decision and a family by family decision. But um, I think there's merit in, in both, both avenues. And it, it really just comes down to what you want and who you are. And, and, you know, me as a player, when I was in high school, I probably would want to go someplace where I could play understanding the benefit of the other side, but you know, understanding too that I want to get on the court and I want to be able to develop in a game situation. So I think it, again, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's, it's really a family decision and going off gut and, and what's the best spot for that kid. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, you know, when I transferred to that school, I transferred in high school to the number one team in the state. And like, you know, we had eight D1 guys eventually on that team. Rick Patino's son was on a team. So we got to do stuff like practice at UK we played all over the country and, you know, I like that better than potentially scoring 18 a game at a, on a lesser team. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's my personal, my personal thing though. So everyone's got to make their own decision on that. But let me ask you this. The reason that kind of comes up is because a lot of families are always asking me, well, we want to go somewhere where my son can play. Now you get this probably all the time when kids reach out to you as they want to know, like, am I going to play 20 minutes? I'm going to play zero minutes. Like, what do you think? How do you answer that? And how does, how does playing time work with you at your school? I mean, is it, is, it, is it a blank slate and whoever earns it in practice gets playing time or do kids that come back get more playing time? Explain that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, this has evolved as I've coached. And I think I really like how we've been able to develop our system. Uh, and we've tried to eliminate gray area and emotion from conversations as much as possible. And obviously this isn't a, it's not a blanket thing. Um, but the way we try to handle this is we stat everything. So our program is data driven. So from the day our, our team is formulated um, and we do have, you know, we've got kids to play football and run cross country and, and we've got kids that do different things, but the core group of players that we have, we stat from day one until they graduate. We have data on every shooting drill that we do barring when they're in the gym on their own. Um, we stat every 
you know, every pickup game that we play in the fall, every practice we film and we stat and we have a pretty robust Excel spreadsheet. And then we quantify and, and value certain things a little bit more than others, but we come up with a, what we call hustle stats or player efficiencies. And they get that every single day. So at the end of said workout or, you know, said pickup, they're going to see, you know, this is my missed box outs. This is my good defensive rotations, missed defensive rotations, my assist to turnover ratio. This is my virtual assist. This is my paint touch, et cetera. So um, that then gets formulated and they get what we call your player efficiency or hustle stat. And then they see a ranking every single day of where they are as our team. And what we've done is, is we've basically said, Hey, you know, this is information. It's not, uh, it's, it's not perfect, but it gives us a sense of where you're at. And if you earn and work your way into a higher rating in these hustle stats, you've earned yourself uh, a starting spot. So basically that's the way we formulate it. So um, what you do is going to determine your time. And so I think we're a little unique in that sense and it requires a lot of work on our end, but I think it's really valuable. So when we sit down with a player, and we talk about, okay, if you come to Asheville, you're going to get better. Okay, how am I going to get better? We have data to show. So on day one, this is what you're doing. These are the guys you're competing against. A month in, you want to improve in these focus areas. And we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and, and watch tape to say, okay, to get to college and to be really efficient and to do the things you want to do in college uh, as a player, these are stats that you need to improve on. So, and if you want more time and you're competing with these two other guys, um, these are things that you can improve upon that they're a little ahead of you at right now. I also like it because early on in my career, I was a lot more emotional than I am now. And, you know, guys make what I would call, and we would say is an ugly mistake. So it's something that looks egregious during the course of the game that, you know, as a 25 year old, I might've been like, all right, we got to get them out of the game. And then we go back and we look at the data and we grade the tape. And actually they were really efficient. Just that one mistake that looks glaring in the moment actually uh, was pretty minor when you look at the player's whole collective performance that game and throughout the course of the season. So um, that's how we deal with that. So, you know, when we talk to families and we talk to our players, that's, that's really what we discuss is, Hey, this is all data driven. You earn it. And the more that you're in the gym, and the, the better you play, the more time you have. Um, so we try to take the emotion out of it and we try to make it really black and white. And this is, this is what helps you win. And this is the formula that we use. And then if you're able to embrace it and do really well in it, you can open up doors. And we had a player actually two years ago at Asheville who came to run cross country, was 6'6", decided to play basketball too. Um, if you had told me by the, yeah, at the beginning of the year that he would be starting by the end, I, I probably would have said no way. But he figured out that he could get us extra possessions by crashing really hard and getting tips and getting offensive rebounds and not shooting bad shots. And so his value just increased throughout the course of the year. And by the time February rolled around, he was starting for us um, because he was able to do these things that we really value in our system. Where'd you get the idea to do this? Uh, this was college coaches and then some development of my own that we've kind of tweaked. But yeah, you know, there's teams that used to beat us at USF and picking their brain on, on how they do things. Uh, I, when I became a prep coach, I was kind of like, all right, I want to do this. <laughs> uh, but it's evolved. You know, we, we didn't really do it at New Hampton. And it was something that when I came here, uh, we've really embraced. And I think it's been really good for our program and for our players. And is there a kid that might, not score well, but just can still play? Or does that, have you seen over the years Absolutely. that doesn't work? Yeah, the kid I just okay. mentioned, he's a great example of that. You know, he, he probably averaged 2.5 points a game for us, but he was at, uh, if you looked at his efficiencies, they were close to a 1.65, which is really high for us. Um, you know, our, our really, really good players are above a 2.0. Uh, we want, as a team, to be at a 1.1 or higher in terms of our hustle stats and efficiencies. So he was able to not score, but he got tips he got paint touches he got us second and third opportunities to score which you know we want possessions so if we have three possessions to the other team's one we feel pretty good about our opportunity to win so yeah that that's how guys that maybe aren't gifted scorers are able to get on the court for us and, and carve out a role for themselves but are there guys on the flip side that are good basketball players that, that maybe just don't score well yeah, and we, we factor that in. So, for example, our point guard right now, who's a, who's a really good player, he's being recruited at a high level. Um, his efficiencies are through the roof. He was our highest last year on our team, but his turnovers were also the highest. So, you know, obviously, if they're the dominant ball guard, they're going to have more turnovers. Okay, they're making more decisions. They have the ball in their hands more often. So we try to factor that in, uh, but it's a scale. So everything has different values. There's pluses and minuses assigned for each each thing. So, for example, if you miss a two and you miss a three, it's the same. 
Um, if you make a three, it's more valuable than if you make a two, obviously. So that might seem elementary, but you know, a miss is a miss. Um, but we want high percentage shots. We want high percentage basketball plays. Um, so yeah, you know, I think if you're a good basketball player, you're, it's a cliche saying, but you're going to find ways to be around the basketball and impact the game. And I think that that plays out in stats in a lot of ways. This is great. I don't know any other high school program that does this detail that you do, and because it must take a lot of time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my wife will tell you it takes a lot of time, uh, but no, yeah, we, we put a lot of time in it. And again, I think that's why when we talk to families about, okay, you're going to be prepared when you get to college. Like this is the data that you have. And this is the attention to detail that we try to put into helping our kids get better. Yeah, but anyone says anything about playing time, you just go, well, here's yeah, the numbers. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously there's variants that, you know, yeah. things that might come up, but I think we've got great kids in our program that buy into this. And this is stuff we talk about from day one. So I think they, they buy into it and they get it. Um, you know, the only, you know, the only downside is a kid that's more worried about stats, but I think that that sort of washes itself out. And, um, you know, we've got really smart kids here too. So sometimes they're like, okay, what's the grade I can get. So yeah. we have to walk them back from that sometimes. Yeah. How can I hack this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's the thing too. All right. Let's touch on, touch on that. Do college coaches care about statistics? I high school so. statistics. Yeah, you think so? Valuable for uh, well, not yours. I'm talking like points per game, rebounds per game. Uh, no, in, in my opinion, no. Uh, but I think the way that we are able to share our data with coaches is really powerful because they can look at okay, this is their deficiencies, this is their strengths. Um, but you know, we never had a kid at New Hampton average over the highest we ever had was Micah Adams Woods and he was at 17 a game uh, his last year, but we very seldomly had anyone over 15 a game. And it's the same thing here. Uh, and some of that is the way we play and we play a little bit more methodically, but um, that was never a knock on any of our players. You know, if anything, it's what do they shoot percentage wise, something like that might be more impactful, but not, you know, are they at 30 points a game or are they at 11 points a game? Yeah. I don't think kids realize that Nick. I really no. don't. Yeah. Or parents. You know, you know, if you look at Jason, who does an awesome job at Brewster, and, you know, if, if everybody on his team wanted to score 30 points a game, you know, they're averaging 300 points a game or something. So, and he does a really good job getting them to understand role. And uh, so I've always appreciated that about Jason is the way he can manage those guys and, and their scoring outlook. Yeah, and not that too, but every time I reach out to a guy like you with a potential prep school client, you, you, no one ever asked me the points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game. They don't care. They want to see, you know, his academics, his highlights, game tape, find out about his character, et cetera, et cetera. But I've never once, and hearing that you as a former college coach, you guys don't look at it either. I think more kids need to know that. And more kids need to know too that, and I've said this many a times, like, yeah, scoring is like one of 10 things to do in the game. And your, your program says as much too. Like there's nine other things, if not more, that college coaches are looking at besides you just putting the ball in the buckets. Sure. Yeah, and I think it's a whole picture. And, and you know, I, I think the best, best kids I've ever coached have been kids that can check a lot of boxes and are bought into whatever the team needs. And if you do that, you're going to get dividends on, on your own. And your own merit is going to – be magnified when we as a team are playing at a really high level. And uh, so, yeah, we, we talk about that a lot, trying to buy into one another and serving one another and elevating each other as we play and we practice. All right. You've coached D one guards, you've been at the D one level and there's more guards out there than any other position. And it seems like every single one of them wants to play D one. Mm -hmm. So what does a guard need Nick to possess, to play at the D one level? I think, uh, <laughs> Size is great, obviously. So if you're six four, that's going to open up some doors, and you can do a variety of things. Um, you know, for us, the way we play and the way we played at San Francisco is we ball screen a lot, and we like to give our point guards a lot of autonomy. So I think understanding an IQ for me has always been really valuable. Um, I'm less concerned with you know, is a kid a jet or you know what his burst is like but can he get to the paint and can he find teammates and he can he make teammates better and then in single coverage or in a ball screen can he score um so i think those are things that i i look for but i i think you know being vocal being a leader i think can separate you how hard you play um and a lot of these skills are transferable to any position in my opinion but um personally i, I like guys that have really high iq that are leaders and um, and I think the big differentiator, excuse me now, is, is can you shoot it at a really high clip from the three-point line? I think for us, and I didn't do this early on in my career, and it, you know, it's something that we really do a lot now is we shoot a ton. Uh, if we're in the gym, 
you know, six days out of the week, we're, we're shooting at least 30 minutes of every practice and every workout is shooting from beyond the three point line. And we have a packet of competitive shooting drills we do, but I, I think that's really important. Uh, and if you want to separate yourself now, it's the ability to shoot the ball from three. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Well, now we're going to do the rapid fire questions sure. at the end of the podcast here. Um, what's the best win of your career as a coach? Any uh, level. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, at BYU, when I was at San Francisco, uh, in front of a sold out crowd, we went on the road, we were young. Uh, we won, we played awesome. And it was a lot of fun to celebrate afterwards as a team. And you guys being a WCAC, WCC uh, played Gonzaga quite a bit. What was that like? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know the stat off the top of my head. I mean, not, I'm not going to do this justice, but Rex actually has a really good winning percentage against Gonzaga. So, uh, but, but they were, I mean, Mark Few is unbelievable. The program they have is, you know, it's one of the best, obviously, in the world. Uh, but we played them with Karnowski and Olenek. And uh, you just talk about a program that every year has guys buy in to the things that, it takes to win and impact winning. Um, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. You know, Randy Bennett at St. Mary's is an unbelievable coach and the program that he's built in Moraga is, you know, one that I've always really admired. Um, and he's a great coach and he's got really good players and they get better throughout the course of their time there. So yeah, it's just an unbelievable basketball conference. I think it's still underappreciated even with how good Gonzaga is now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, best player you've coached against at the prep school level and at the college level? That's a good question too. Uh, prep level, I'm going to say Jalen Adams when he was at Brewster. He was awesome for them. Um, we had a game plan on how to take him out of action and he was always able to, to find a way to come up with a big shot or get to the paint. Um, and then in college, that, that's a good one. Uh, David West at Xavier when I was at Rhode Island. Sure. Actually, no, I take that back. Sorry, Jameer Nelson. He was really good when he was at St. Joe's. Oh, that's when they were at their peak. Yes, yes. They were really good. We had a chance to beat them, and we lost at the buzzer at the Ryan Center with Dick Vitale doing that game. But it was uh, – we were close. So, But they were really good. He and Delonte West, um, they were fun. Okay. Uh, favorite movie of all time? All right. Favorite movie. Um, <laughs> that's a good one, too. I'm going to say Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, yeah. Good choice. You know, my favorite movie is Life Aquatic, another Wes Anderson yeah, good choice. Good choice. clip. And uh, you can't go wrong with those. No, no. Uh, wait, the last one, French Dispatch. you see that one yet? I did see that one, yeah. I don't know. Something about yeah. it, I just... It's fine, yeah. Yeah, it didn't hit like the previous ones did, yeah. so. All right, last one. When you're not coaching basketball, which it sounds like you're doing quite a bit, uh, what are your hobbies? Yeah, I like, uh, I like music, so I play uh, a variety of instruments. And one of the reasons my wife and I were really excited about moving to Asheville is there's tons of music venues, um, music festivals. So, so we see a lot of live music. Um, I like Premier League soccer, so there's a big group of faculty here who follow that. And uh, I don't play pickup basketball as much, but I do play pickup soccer, which is fun now that I'm a little bit older. So, uh, and then I coach my son's five-year-old soccer team. So that, uh, that starts next weekend. So that'll be my weekend activity. Nice. I know you've got the Orange Peel in town. That's a famous venue uh, yeah. down in yep. Nashville. Yep, Orange Peel, Great Eagle. Uh, there's the Harris Civic Center, which is the big one. That's where the SoCon tournament is. So, yeah, we're really lucky. I mean, there's tons of good acts that come down here and musicians that live in town. So it's been fun. Nick, is there anything you want to share that we did not go over today? No, no. I appreciate you having me on. And, uh, yeah, this is great. It was fun to talk hoops and independent schools. And then uh, where can people find you if they want to – find you on social media yeah so you know our, our school website's www.ashnoschool.org and then i'm on twitter um it's nick j whitmore perfect well nick thanks for joining us in the prep athletics podcast um if you guys enjoyed this please subscribe on the youtube channel we're also on all the major podcasting platforms you can subscribe there as well to make sure you don't miss a thing and if you want to reach out to me uh, you can find me at prepathletics.com and I'll put Nick's contact information in the show notes. So Nick, thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Corey. All right. We'll see you guys next week on the prep athletics podcast. Take care.